when we talk about aggression in sport, I want us to be absolutely critical about what we are talking about. And I've sort of summarised that we've got three kinds. I'm going to chuck one in as a fourth possibility as well. First of all, we've got hostile aggression. Or What we mean here is this is a direct act, probably of violence, where it's outside the rules of whatever they're doing and it's the intent to harm. So notice, for example, a, a punch in boxing would not be included in this because it's within the rules. But this is someone going dysfunctional and doing something daft. That's what we're talking about here, a punch, a kick, um, in obviously in a, a non-combat uh, scenario. Now, instrumental is slightly different here. We've got sort of a grey area. We've got within the rules, it's got the intent to perform the skill, but harm could be a byproduct. So, for example, this could be like really, this could be something like, um, a bouncer in cricket where effectively you're aiming for the body but your objective is to get the performer out and it's it's within the rules right so that's an example now assertion is effectively non-violence it's robust play it's it's within the rules and no intent to harm you're trying to perform the skill this could be like a very powerful drive to the basketball to make a basketball hoop to make a layup for example but you might make contact with somebody on the way this is assertive play uh, it's a strong tackling rugby this is assertive play now the other thing i want to just um Mention here is verbal and specifically racist or could also be sexist, etc. Abuse. This is a form of aggression that has become quite common. I just want to sort of throw that in the mix here as, as something that should be sort of considered within these contexts as well. Now, with all that said, what we're going to do is I want to get to the main two interactionist theories quite quickly. So what I've done in a very sort of primitive way, really, I've written out for you what instinct theory is. And when we get to... Um, when we get to social learning theory, we'll look at the same thing. I've basically described these in advance and we're going to evaluate them. So instinct theory is a trait theory suggesting that violence or aggression comes from biological drive, the fight for survival. It's effectively Darwinian in its development. And it's the idea is that sport is a channel for aggression and it gives that cathartic release. If you're not sure what catharsis means, it means stress release, energy release. And sport can do that. So what is it that's ultimately good about this theory? Well, we can argue that sort of aggression does seem natural okay so there does seem to be some kind of natural tendency if you want to uh, look more into sort of that sort of fight for survival in biological terms i mean there's a lot of that in nature people argue that aggression is hard to control okay so therefore maybe this is an argument for this and some are consistently aggressive so some people are a really aggressive kind of individuals is it the fact that they are predetermined to be that way. Now you might have different views on that, but that's what we're saying here. It's predictable in some people. Some people are quite commonly aggressive. So predictable in some people. That would suggest it's more to do with a trait. Again, I would encourage you to consider whether there's other explanations for that. And people do experience catharsis. And what we mean by that is once that kind of aggression has been released, people do seem to kind of be a different person you know like uh, having a drink after the match for example so these are some of the strengths that we might sort of say of, uh, about this but there of course there's major weaknesses it's certainly not all people so it's therefore hard to determine that this is a human instinct because not all people do this and we can really suggest that not all cultures of Ireland. <laughs> so there's numerous cultures, probably the majority of cultures, remember I'm using the word culture here, that would be non-aggressive. That might surprise you, not all cultures are large, of course. Um, it's a very simplistic model, okay? So very simplistic. You know, it, it's sort of trying to explain something in a, in a very basic way. It's highly generalised. Okay, so it's making huge generalizations and therefore they can lead to stereotypes basically. So generalizations are broad and stereotypes. We do see aggression having aggression does have environmental stimuli. There's meant to be two S's in there. Does have, if I put environmental stimuli, hard word to write, isn't it? Environmental. So stimuli. So there are times where the actual envir environment triggers aggression, therefore we could argue um, it's not always natural. Aggression is often provoked, okay? So it comes from an environmental stimulus. There's an example of that. It's also often copied. So it may well be that uh, an aggressive role model is copied and therefore that would lead more towards social learning. And also people are capable to unlearn aggression and this often comes with age and experience and people can unlearn aggression so those would be criticisms of instinct theory now social learning theory and we're looking at four theories total by the way social learning theory is the opposite of course we're talking about learning through modeling it can be taught and it's all about the role of experience education and reinforcement now this gives some interesting 
this this gets some interesting sort of aspects it's strong because it explains why people react differently okay so people react differently because they've got different social conditioning it also explains why people go a bit different when they cross the white line so it helps to explain the environmental requirement of let's say aggressive behavior it's really good because it considers the role of others and parents in the development of aggressive tendencies and i think a lot of us in life's experience can suggest that yeah these things do play a role i also really like this point it gives responsibility to people you know if you are biologically predetermined to be aggressive well you're kind of out of control with that right if th this gives responsibility to the performer to the coach and we can also say that people become or some people say become less aggressive over time this is to do with learning okay so that would suggest that there is a social element to that now we don't need to say it's necessarily all social but there we go now weaknesses of this model it ignores traits okay so is there an argument that traits play a role it also and you'll see what i mean by this it doesn't state specifically which cues in the environment might lead to aggression now we're going to look at another model that does that it doesn't consider also why people do uh, different things in the same situation so we might get the same situation and we might get different responses now that that is harder to explain with social learning theory okay so we've got the same situation different responses well how can that be if the if aggression is environmental now of course you could argue there that people have different types of social learning that could explain that now all of that that i've just done is really the gateway to get to what i want to spend my time on during this tutorial which is the main two interactionist theories of aggression and obviously you see we're sort of stepping up in terms of the quality of how we're presenting this because this is really a proper model of aggression not just we learn it from others not just it's a biological thing so this is the dollard theory and it's called the frustration aggression a hypothesis and i want to go through some critical points about it first of all so this suggests that that um aggression is all about a goal being blocked so think about yourself in a sports performance you've got a drive to a goal now that doesn't mean to score a goal necessarily that could be but you've got uh, an op uh, you've got an objective to make a certain time to get in the final uh, to, to 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 run past your opponent to score a goal to make a tackle now what the theory is suggesting is if that goal is blocked by some kind of obstacle that this always and this is a really important point that this always leads to frustration okay so they're arguing that this will lead to frustration and that that frustration will always lead to aggression so if there's an obstacle obstacle to a goal we will experience frustration and that frustration always leads to aggression doesn't necessarily say what type of aggression now if that aggression is successful and by the way by successful we're not talking about getting away with it necessarily it's that if it gets you closer to the goal if it helps you to achieve the goal if it's successful the performer will experience catharsis the release of that frustration so the the action the aggression is ultimately aimed at getting the goal achieved but if that aggression leads to let's say a punishment let's say that um they're they're substituted off of that action or let's say for example they receive a disciplinary action from a referee or for example they have a point removed or for example it just fails and doesn't work and they still got buried and blocked the goal then frustration is going to be returned to and then we're going to get into the cyclical environment and sometimes we can call this we can link this obviously to our catastrophe theory okay now what's good and bad about this theory well first of all we like it because it's more realistic okay it's more realistic than for example social learning theory um the idea of goal blocking the idea of goal blocking is evident in sport okay so of course people don't always succeed in sport so goal blocking is there we can also say that catharsis does occur and what we mean by that is that if the aggressive action is functional it, it leads to success then that of course is going to sort of be evident that aggression will end we also get the idea that the link between f and a so frustration always leading to aggression is useful because that would suggest then if we can identify frustration we can also identify that aggression is going to happen and perhaps prevent it or if that's what we want to do and it also means this is the point i just made coaches can manage coaches can manage aggression 
Okay, so coaches can manage aggression. Now, there are, of course, weaknesses to these, this theory. We need to address them. We know that frustration does not always lead to aggression. That means does not always equal aggression, okay? So it doesn't always lead to aggression. Secondly, we can argue that we can have frustration without aggression. People can get frustrated without getting aggressive. You have seen that in your life. We can also say that aggression is often learned in people. Now, this fact, this theory doesn't take this into account. It just suggests that it happens as a result of frustration. Okay, but people do learn aggression. They, they learn it through um, uh, models, for example. We also know that unpunished aggression, unpunished does not always equal catharsism. So even if it goes unpunished, people do not always have that cathartic release, and that's a problem here. This model completely ignores traits. So there's a there's a criticism right there. It doesn't take trait theory into account. And the goal blocking, goal blocking does not always lead to frustration. I'll just put F in there. So those are some criticisms, but it's a nice way of us explaining how aggression might occur. Now to finish off with, and hang in there with me folks, because we are nearly there, I promise, we're gonna have a look at the Berkowitz aggressive cue hypothesis. Now it's a great way to think about this, that this is a scapegoat theory. Okay, a scapegoat theory, and that is, it's like kicking the cat because you're frustrated with something else. Don't please don't kick a cat. Um, but you know, what I, mean? I mean it metaphorically. So what we what we're saying here is that effectively, um, what what Berkowitz is is identifying is that some some kind of environmental cue. Let's say that performance is going badly. It's going to lead to an increase in arousal. Now, when that arousal goes up, a couple of possibilities uh, might happen here the first one is that there's no aggressive cue present okay now if there's no aggressive cue and by the way an aggressive cue can be a weapon an object uh, the nature of the game it could be a place it could be a person it could be an event it could be perceived unfairness it could be witnessing violence if none of that is present let's say you don't have a hockey stick in your hand you're obviously not likely to then swing a hockey stick because there's no there's no um, item cue available there whereas if that cue is available, for example, if you've got the a, a presence of, let's say, a hockey stick in the hand, the tendency for aggression goes up. Whereas, if we don't have the aggressive uh, cue present, the tendency of, of aggression goes down. Now, can I stress, this could be about a person who's the aggressive cue. Let's say you've got a really big rival, for example. If you're not doing well in your game and your arousal goes up and you're not playing against that big rival, the tendency for you to maybe smash the racket or whatever it happens to be might be less and less and less, right? But if that cue is available, the person you detest is on the other side of the net, say, then the tendency for that aggression to come out may well be there. Now, there's a couple of strengths and weaknesses. Really good strength is it explains the nature of environmental influence. It explains environmental influence. It doesn't just say that, well, you know, the environment plays a part. It specifically says the aggressive cue is the dictating factor. It also states that aggressive cues are individual not they are individuals but the aggressive cues for me and you are extremely likely to be different to one another okay we're different people it also explains and remember one of our criticisms from dollard's frustration aggression it explains why frustration does not always lead to aggression so because the aggressive cue might not be there but there are problems to this theory first of all people do display aggression without cues some people you know just get aggro okay so that can happen also it's very complex because of course you and i are different our experience is different our cues are different and the other thing here is it ignores traits so we've gone through there a really comprehensive guide an evaluative structure for four theories of aggression starting with our uh, our different types of aggression at the start i realize that's a chunky old tutorial for your folks but it's a damn content filled one and highly evaluative i hope it's useful cheers